that she needs. I'll pull up the one I need, she when it gets hot. I'm proud of all the things that I've got. I'm digging the miles back up in the sand. And after work, a cold beer in my hand. Picking wild berries off God's land. And drinking my buddy's homemade wine. Living Northwest wild. Hunting, fishing is my kind of style. I float the wine new chi when it gets hot. I'm proud of all the things that I've got. I'm digging in my specs up in the sand. And after work, a cold beer in my hand. Picking wild berries off God's land. And drinking my buddy's homemade wine. In the Northwest wild. <clears throat> hey, good evening and welcome, Fish Hunt Northwest. Dwayne England, Tommy Donlin back in studio. Yes, indeed. Once it's been again. a grind. Oh, this week, man, I'm telling man, you. I'm it's exhausted. Been rough. You're exhausted. <laughs> Shingle exhausted. Josh is behind the uh, the podium over there doing his thing. He's ex <laughs> Wake up, Josh. Is he sleeping? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think he might be. So, uh, man, it is, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting yeah. week. I just, on all fronts, there's just so much going on. It's just. Uh, there's a ton going on. Even. Uh, it, Within the information we're going to cover tonight, but even beyond that, just you know, in our day to day lives, work schedules, yep. and everything else, it's just, it's just uh, busy, busy, busy. So lots of folks jumping on here. Hey, Carl, nice to see you jumping back on this evening, and we got a lot of great yeah. topics to cover tonight, Tommy. And we're going to cover, you know, car one of Carl's favorite topics. We're going to talk about safety tonight, Carl, and oh, that's going to be a good one. We're going to talk about ocean safety. Yep, yep. Um, that's going to be a really good talk. That's towards the end of the show. And it's not just a yeah. one and done. We have you, my friend, are so well. Uh, educated in a wide range of things that you know you should know mm -hmm. and yeah, there's a definitely. handful of folks that just kind of they don't really pay attention to that stuff yeah you take it very serious and uh, proud of you for that yep. so I uh, I tend to lean more towards the safe side of things just oh, yeah. you know 30 plus years in, in in the line of work I do so we kind of we take safety to heart and we make yeah. it a priority and there are just Definitely. a number of things that uh, you have even opened my eyes to that, yeah, we're going to discuss periodically, especially even as we roll through the next several weeks into months and get towards that tuna time on the open mm -hmm. ocean. We got halibut fisheries coming up, which we're going, we're going out in the big water. So yep. definitely things to cover. I'm glad you're bringing that up tonight. We will, uh, we will jump back on that in no time. Uh, hey, Cerdix checking in. We got uh, Jeremy John checking in. Got a Springer today. Nice. Oh, with Jack, with Glass. Jack Glass. Nicely done, man. We're getting Congrats. down there tomorrow uh, with our buddy Chris V, Chris Vertopoulos, uh, Chris V's guide service. So we're going to hang out with Chris tomorrow. More on that a little later. But nice job, Jeremy mm -hmm. John. Way to get one, buddy. Um, they taste nothing like kokanee, and I'm sure you're well aware. Yeah. Uh, hey, kokanee tastes really good, though, too. Phenomenal. I mean, yeah. I've actually had one. Yeah. It was great. <laughs> I didn't catch it, but no, I, I ate it. No, but you ate it. And there is still a chance. There's still hope. You yes, know, there one is. Day you're going to go with me. And we're going to catch bait. Someday. You're, you're going to yes, eat bait. Someday. So, um, <laughs> anyway, hey, uh, everyone, thanks for jumping on here tonight. Uh, Fish Hunt Northwest is presented by uh, Defiance Marine, uh, Better Homes and Gardens, Pacific Commons, uh, Real Estate in Puyallup, mm -hmm. Washington, and, uh, of course, uh, Phoenix Protective Corp. And uh, a little more on those folks in a little bit. Speaking of Defiance Marine, we're getting close. We're yeah. Getting close. Counting down the days. I can see it, man. I made room out here, right? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, you cleaned up the driveway, got rid of all the other vehicles in the driveway. Yeah, you had to, you, had to, it's, uh, you know, we're through the winter months. I can move the other trailers yeah. up top now and not uh, be subjected to large limbs falling out of the trees and ditching right. our FHN right. trailer and things like that. So we move inventory, Tommy. We've got to make room for the new uh, Wessel, as it were. So yes. looking forward to that. Um, Hey, running down the show tonight, we got, uh, we'll be joined a little bit later here by, uh, by uh, Mike Surik. Uh, that man. He's making it look easy on the Columbia for his, Springers. And his, and his yeah. uh, dad and uh, brothers yeah. and whatnot, they, they, I think it's the way they spin their herring or something or hold their mouth I, or whatever. I think so. 
Yeah, I I'm think gonna so. Ask we're, him, we got to talk about that. Is there that. any difference of that spin you put on that herring out yeah. in CQ versus what you're doing there in the, in mm -hmm. the Columbia? Because let's mm -hmm. face it, they went out there last week and they flat out put on a clinic. It, it might be the electronic dance music that, it that, could Mike, be that Mike plays on the boat. <laughs> well, we'll talk, him, well, I'll talk to him about that one. <laughs> we'll get into that little yeah. magic mic out there on the boat. Okay, Ooh. huh? <laughs> <laughs> See if you can put some magic in yeah, that Yeah, there you go. Um, <laughs> long time friend. First time we're going to finally get him on the show. Hard man to pin down. He's so busy and on the run all the time. If you've talked to him, you know that this guy is nothing short of high speed, uh, even when he's talking in his sleep. Bonner Daniels, been a buddy for a long time, phenomenal guide. Uh, we're checking with Bonner. He's been beating up the Calves. Do I dare say they actually boated a Springer and a Summer Run the other day? The oh, same day. Oh, really? The in the same already, day? Uh, even before April, right here at the end of March, they, uh, they actually pulled that off. So mm -hmm. Springer had to go back. Summer Run got to go in the box. We'll talk to him all about that. I'm um, going to check in with, uh, with Eric Broaden. Uh, yes. We had Eric join us last year on our get-together over there on the east side. He gave a walleye talk? He gave a walleye talk. Yeah. Phenomenal walleye fisherman. Very, very knowledgeable. He brought maps. He brought, I mean, just a ton of info. Big guys were just like, oh, my God, look at all this. Yeah. Um, he is also very accomplished in the realm of Turkey. We are, uh, we are slated to meet up with him towards the end of the month. Um, and as we roll into the first weekend of May, over on the east side, couple three days uh, going after Turkey. We're yes. trying to accomplish uh, getting some with a shotgun, some with a bow. Ooh! And try to get some great footage to bring back here so everybody can enjoy. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And we may have a couple special guests joining us that I'm pretty excited about. So we'll we'll see where we land there. But some great guests line up. Safety talk from you later on, my friend. Before we get there, we do have a ton of things going on around the Pacific Northwest and beyond. Mm -hmm. A lot of it hinges on some things going on in the realm of uh, uh, conducting drafting seasons and what we're yes. up against yeah. in this north of Falcon process. But before we go there, uh, did you uh, have you picked up your fit? We're going fishing tomorrow. Uh, I did. I did. You got your fishing license? I got. I stopped at Sportco, mm -hmm. went in there, and I got the uh, the Get Outdoors package. Atta boy. So the hunting, the fishing. The, the migratory bird endorsement, the two whole turkey deal. tags, yeah. the, whole, the whole nine yards. Perfect. It is secured in my pocket. We're going to have to put that migratory bird license to use yes. this year. We'll have Mike Sertic on later, as we mentioned. We'll have to remind him of that. Uh, get you on some snow geese this next season and or Might have uh, to do that. some mallards. That would be fantastic. Yeah. So, uh, yes, we too uh, are all licensed up and ready to go to the tune of several hundred dollars. But, you know... Yeah. It's cost of doing business. You know what? You only live once, man. That's what I tell recreate everybody. You and you can break it yep. out by a month and you're going to end up, you know, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks no, a month. Yeah. Who cares? Nobody, nobody does this game to, to make money. No. Or, or you just got to pay the man and go enjoy. So I'll make sure if you have forgotten, you need to get your new licenses starting today, April 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, happy April, by the way. First show of April and uh, spring is here, man. We're off and running. So. Um, just make it sure, remind everybody, get your fishing licenses if you have not gotten them already. And you can do the full outdoor package. The Fish Washington is pretty good for those of you that only fish. That's something you definitely want to do. It has your two rod endorsement. It has your uh, salt water, your fresh water. It has your salmon steelhead punch cards. And you can add your halibut retention card to that as well. Right, that's additional, by the way. That is additional. That's not included that in is any not of the included. packages. No, nope. yep. you gotta buy that separately. Um, mm -hmm. Also, the, uh, the uh, fish washing in also includes your shellfish, so your crabbing, yeah. your clamming, and, uh, and your shrimping. All that is in there. So, uh, yeah, just make sure you get your licensing. Along with that, there's some other things that uh, kind of caught my interest uh, the last couple days. Buddy JJ sent me a thing this morning. Hey, did you see Canada's announcement yesterday? Yeah, I did. And I was like, uh, no. Uh, I was kind of busy yeah. at work. And he goes, yeah, apparently there's no Chinook retention. Right. I was like, what do you mean, no Chinook retention? Yeah. We kind of delved into this a little bit. You actually looked into it a little more than yeah, I. Yeah, I pulled up the map, and, mm -hmm. and it's it's some of the wording is is not really clear. But effectively, what they've done is those prime areas that are, you know, right across from, you know, Port Angeles, Nia Bay, along their coastline, those areas are closed. There's other areas that are open, but only within one mile from shore. Okay, so like area 123, which is kind of like where Bamfield is, mm -hmm. that's actually open, but only right near shore. Oh. Um, now, 
And you that's really, a change. They're keeping them the, near shore on all these fisheries. Versus. Right. Now, now they did this, you know, pre-COVID, they did this as well. But what they did is when they got close to that July 15th time frame, they opened it back up. Oh. And they said, okay, hey, we'll let you back in there and you can fish offshore again. And, you know, Swiftshire Bank is loaded with fish. I mean, absolutely loaded with fish. So I'm hoping that this ends up being just a temporary rule mm -hmm. and not a permanent one. Um, if it's a permanent one, that would be, um, I would consider that a disaster. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Especially if we burn through the quota on our side first. Good point. And then we get shut down and we can't go over to the Canadian side and fish. Yeah. I consider that to be a disaster. That is a disaster. So I guess it's, uh, they put perspective on it and, you know, look at all the angles before you just go, oh, right on, man. They're yeah. not catching our fish. This is great. Yeah, well, not exactly. Not all our fish, yeah. right? Uh, the good amount of those fish are going to the Fraser too. They're kind well, of that's the reason. That's the reason for it. They're protecting those stocks as yep. well, right? That's the intent of the Canadian uh, change, as it were. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, hey, did you want to go blackmouth fishing in 2022? You know, I would really love to. I'd love to do it in the San Juans, like we used to. <laughs> North of Falcon is happening right now. Some information surfaces on via different groups and organizations, yeah. right? I pulled, a, I pulled a short article off of um, uh, Fish Northwest the other day because it was, it was directly related to Black Mountain mm -hmm. in, the, in the construction of the season as we roll into 2022. And it caught my attention because it really, really points the finger at the Stillaguamish tribe. Yeah. Not mincing words either. It's very clear how the article is written. Not even yeah. beating around the bush about it. Just it's like, it's your guys' fault. You are shutting down an entire Puget Sound blackmouth fishery because of your choices on how you're mitigating and running your hatchery. Right, program. correct. Yep. Uh, and you and I looked at that and went, you know, if there's, if there's some truth to this, it, it's scary for me because it shows me the power that a single tribe in the, at the negotiating table has yeah. to construct or destruct a fishery based on their wants and mm -hmm. needs. Because this trickled down, uh, think, about the, uh, think about the Northwest Derby Series. Yeah, well, that's taken a major hit, right? Think of all the economic impact um, that has been incurred in the San Juan Islands. Correct. I mean, it's, it's not tens of thousands, right? It's hundreds of thousands of dollars of economic impact yep. that have been felt in that region. Well, and you know, WDFW has had a longstanding history of providing a black mouth opportunity. Mm -hmm. There's been lots of money that's allocated for black mouth. They, 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 once they figured that out way back in the 60s and they begin to produce these black mouth, rear them in the freshwater for a year and then release them, realize that, hey, these things will residualize and predominantly stay within Puget Sound and we can fish mm -hmm. them all year round. It's been something that's been long standing. And look at what we had this last year, 2020. We had 17 days in Area 10. Yes, now we have an opportunity out of CQ through the end of April, mm -hmm. which is a two month opportunity. Mm -hmm. But you look at that versus six months in some areas, mm -hmm. year round in Area 13, when and there's actually fish available. Yeah. But it's concerning because if this is the if this is the cog in the wheel right here causing this whole thing, if we're talking marked fish versus unmarked fish, uh, mm -hmm. wire code tagged fish versus actual hatchery, uh, hatchery marked uh, clip fish, right? And that's the kicker to, to drive this thing this direction. I, yeah, I, it pisses me off. Yeah, the art the article's saying that effectively the Stillaguamish tribe has an issue with the way. Uh, British Columbia on the Canadian side samples their fish. Correct. On the commercial side of the house, um, they sample all of the fish. So they're wanting all of the fish, right? Mm -hmm. So these are not clipped fish, by the way. Okay. They are um, just, they don't look any different from a, a wild versus a hatchery fish. Mm -hmm. Well, so the only way they sample them is they want them. Yep. And if they've got the wire coated tag, then that's your hatchery fish. Yeah. Um, but this is kind of indicating that hey, if the Stillaguamas tribe would just follow this um, procedure, this process, which is actually pretty standard and a lot of the tribes do it, we could get away, you know, you could get away with these mark selective fisheries because these Stillaguamas fish wouldn't be touched. So you would get those wild fish, those hatchery fish back yeah. to the Stillaguamas in order to replenish the run. Okay. So, for but, those, so why aren't they willing to do that? That's the question. That's the question. For those that say, well, wait a minute, I thought all hatchery fish were clipped. 
Well, not so much. And no. it's uh, very clear this method is actually employed by other tribes in the region as they are tagging and not marking their hatchery produced fish. It's, it's a method of getting uh, fish back to the hatchery versus being uh, used up in the quotas and, right. and consumed throughout all the travels they got to navigate and through all the uh, catch and release. So, yeah. um, you know, I see what they're doing. Um, and if they really want to survive, I mean, it, it's very, uh, they put it right here, effectively making every fish that left the Stiloguamish River a wild fish. I mean, that would be the end game. So you're going to get max return of uh, survival of whatever that number is. Right. You're going to at least try to maximize that and, and really ensure that you're shoring up that, that hatchery program and building it, right? Right. Instead, they're opting to mark those fish. Those fish get those fish get taken uh, from mm -hmm. recreational opportunity throughout the way. They're also getting taken up there in Canada from time to time in some of those fisheries. Their big stance here is that, like you had just mentioned, that recreational up there in Canada is, is uh, conflicting on how they're managing the fishery. Yeah. The truth is it's such a- Menial. Oh, you can barely even right. register it. Yeah. And they want to utilize that as like a an undocumented impact that they just can't they see can't, how they, they can't can, handle it. They so therefore, they got to shut down the whole thing. Yeah. So, yeah. I, you know, I would like uh, I would like somebody else to weigh in on this. I, I'm actually going to uh, do a little dig and try. It's it's tough for us right now to get folks on the phone from WDFW because of North Falcon. middle middle of the North of Falcon process. But we have we have a handful mm -hmm. of things that we want to reach out to them and get some get some very uh, very on point information from the department from the. Mm -hmm persons involved in some of these uh, programs to say, what's your true perspective on this? What's your take? What, why is this happening? Yeah. Why is it not? Yeah. And we're going to do that. We uh, got a lot of questions, not just about oh, this, man. this particular instance of the Stiligwamish tribe and river, but yep. also we're going to jump into here in a bit, um, the fish Northwest lawsuits and permitting process. Yeah, that is, uh, that is next segment for sure. We're going to, we're going to keep this conversation going because that one there is, uh, <clears throat> that one is blowing up social media as we speak. We opted not to uh, entertain the idea of getting either side of this uh, little banter on social media on the uh, phone tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, but Tommy and I are going to paint our perspective on how this is going or not going in. Reminding everyone, hey, at the end of the day, we're all on the same team. We all want more hatchery fish. We all want more opportunity. We all are willing to go pay our licenses and have that opportunity. We need these groups to come together and work collectively. So Amen. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, before we jump out for a break though, Tommy, we do have some uh, seasons, proposed seasons on the table that, uh, that are, well, they're really not much of a surprise. I mean, up around Skagit and some of those Northern rivers, mm -hmm. we're, looking at, uh, we're looking at plus you know, bonus uh, limits with the addition of our pink salmon return this year, yes, it's 2021, it's an odd year, it's a humpy year. So um, Skagit River, you're looking at two plus two on your daily limits and some of those would be uh, two coho uh, or a, um, yeah, two coho and of course your additional pinks. Looks like we're gonna be releasing Chinook and Chum in most of those systems. Uh, Baker Lake, uh, very bold print right there, closed to salmon fishing. That tells me we're not looking so good on that, uh, on the, in that regard to our sockeye opportunity, which is mm -hmm. disappointing. Um, was hoping to see a rebound there, but along with that, uh, that particular run of sockeye, Lake Washington sockeye is also struggling. It's just, yeah. it's not getting any better. Yeah. Uh, to the tune of millions upon millions upon millions of dollars and we just cannot get these sockeye back. It's, it's very disheartening. Um, some of the other ones that kind of caught my eye, uh, you know, the Green River, we're looking at a, uh, a limit of six fish. Why? Because yeah. we got those pinks, right? Um, they put that in there, a daily limit six, up to three maybe adults. D does it say what the Green River run is in the documentation? As in the forecast? Yeah, the forecast. Oh, that, I had that earlier, but it doesn't. Yeah. This here is just aligning proposed okay. freshwater season. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. Yeah, so you know, really, that comes down to you're going to keep uh, you're going to keep uh, you know your pinks. You can keep a couple pinks or a couple coho, and then your jacks. But mm -hmm. so you know, six fish, uh, three adults. So you could you could keep a couple coho in a in a uh, pink. Um, some of these though, they actually bump it to uh, two and two. You can keep two coho, two pinks. Remember, your pinks count as you, uh, in your adult limit. Um, Kelp River is actually looking pretty good. When you want to talk about a terminal fishery and you're going to have a Chinook opportunity, mm -hmm. because remember, in Puget Sound, we are down overall 
uh, in the entire region of Puget Sound, we were down significantly in Chinook, 26,000, mm -hmm. I think the number was. Mm -hmm. Projected on a return from what the performance was in 2020. Yeah. So that's a pretty big hit, and that's why I anticipate our Chinook season is looking pretty dismal. On Puget Sound waters, your opportunity is gonna be on your pinks and your coho. Which is interesting because we've had colder water conditions and we've had you know better ocean conditions. We've had good um, herring spawning events. Um, there's bait out there, so it's, it's interesting. All valid points. Yeah. yeah, look at the herring spawn last year in Puget Sound. Yeah, phenomenal. I mean, they flew over with helicopters and drones and, and documented the clouds of the plumes of spawn, right? It yes. was like, they hadn't seen it mm -hmm. in 35 years in Puget Sound. Right. That was encouraging. Mm -hmm. Then these colder ocean conditions that you're mentioning, and we look at the returns happening on the Columbia River. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are, Puget Sound, before any numbers came out, preseason forecast, I was like, man, I can't wait to see these Chinook numbers for Puget Sound. Right. I'm thinking we're gonna have a pretty a good year. uptake. Right, right. And not so much. So, but in that regard, when you look at the Puyallup and the, uh, the season that they're building there, they land limit six, four adults of which only two adults may be Chinook or Coho. You get to keep hatchery Chinook, you get to keep hat, uh, hatchery or wild Coho, and you get to keep your pink salmon. Yeah, good mixed bag. The, uh, the big thing there, people need to pay attention to that lower river, the lower seven miles from the uh, East Main Bridge there in Puyallup, all the way down 11th Street, will be closed on Sundays through uh, August 15th through the 31st. That's pretty normal. That's, uh, that's mostly left uh, closed so that the uh, tribal fishermen can fish. Then when we okay. get into September, it's a full-on closure Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, September 1st through the 31st, that entire month. Mm -hmm. when, the, when the Puyallup tribe are, are down there on that lower river fishing, it's closed for three days. So it's a three, four split. It's nothing new. If you read that this year and you know it, uh, it makes you say some uh, expletives, you're late to the party because <laughs> yeah. it's been something that's been, been going happening. on. Yep. Nisqually River is kind of one that's on my mind because it's right in the backyard here, Tommy, and it surprised me. I actually, Josh and I were talking a few weeks ago. And I said, "Man, you know, with only seventeen thousand fish for, uh, projected to come back, I'll be very surprised if we're looking at much of a recreational opportunity in Terminal River fishery opportunity, bank fishing or drift boat or whatever on the Nisqually." But here it says they are proposing day limit of six to adults. Uh, of course, we'll have we'll have uh, pinks in there as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, release wild Chinook, wild coho, and chum. So your opportunity is gonna be for two hatchery Chinook plus your pink salmon, which is, uh, which is not bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious if that'll get passed through, if they'll actually uh, land there. Um, my plan in a few weeks, maybe get David Trout on the phone from the Squally Tribe and see mm -hmm. really what they're, how they're feeling about their preseason forecast. Remember, the Squally, and we've had David on several times. Mm -hmm. He's a friend, very, very knowledgeable man, has a lot to do with the South Sound. And, uh, mm -hmm. and what happens in the South Sound is it pertains to bringing back these Chinook runs and stuff. Um, he, uh, he, he has talked about the fact that they're, they're planting three to four million Chinook a year mm -hmm. out of Nisqually and McAllister Creek. Yeah, so there's still room though in the Nisqually River to up that number. Mm -hmm. You know, the river system can handle probably I, what I, what did I say? It was like two to, two to three times that amount of fish. Mm. Um, so there's still opportunity to put more fish into the system out of that. It would river. be nicer if yeah. we could just see a uh, a higher percentage of survivability on the return. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, and that's an, that's another planted stock too. That's a green river fish. It is a green river folly. fish. So, and the survival and the strength you know. of that fish. He actually said last time we spoke to him that they're experimenting with changing that strain of fish out wholeheartedly. It's That's like, good. good. This is not working. Good. Let's take this fish, imprint of the squally. This is our new strain of fish that yeah. we're moving forward with. And throw out all the all the talk about wild versus hatchery. You're pulling another fish over. That is by definition a hatchery fish. You planted it there. That fish. So. The, the, the genetic strains. He'll be the first to tell you. Genetic strains of wild Chinook stocks on mm -hmm. the Squally River have been gone since the '60s. Right. Okay. So pump up the production. So pump up the production. Yep. But protecting something that does not need protecting because it's man-made. Skokomish River, for all those that are excited about that, free-flowing fresh waters, including all channels, are closed to salmon fishing. So mm -hmm. at least we're consistent in that regard. No, no Skokomish River, Chinook, or Coho, or Chum, or Sockeye Opportunity coming to you in 2021. Okay, mm -hmm. we're gonna jump out for a quick break. We come back, we're gonna kinda dial this baby in, Tommy. 
Um, we got, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we have some banter going on. Again, we're not trying to throw rocks at this thing. We're just trying to kind of unpack it and say, we're, yeah. where, where, where are we landing here on all this? And is it, is it helpful? Is it uh, detrimental? Which yeah. direction is this going? And, and, you know, at the end of this whole thing, once the dust settles, where are we going to land? So. Right. And we're talking about Fish Northwest and the Puget Sound Anglers and the discussion about the lawsuits around the bold decision. Yep. Um, and, and having an equitable share yep. between the co-managers and... And the permitting yep. and the fact North of Falcon is going on right now. So, Tommy and I are going to weigh in. We've given it a little thought. We've been discussing it. Uh, we're trying to just make sure you guys understand the gravity of all this. What maybe we could do as a fishing community to try and come together on these issues and have some resolve. So, jump out for a quick break. We come back. Uh, we'll be back right here in studio with me and Tommy right here at Fishing Northwest. Lance Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Whether you are looking for a small skiff to fish the sound or rivers or a huge offshore tuna machine, Defiance Marine has it. At Defiance Marine, be sure to power your boat with a Honda Outboard Package. Take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty on your Honda Outboards. Our service department is always here to help and serve you as the customer. Did you know Defiance Marine has boat financing experts to help get you the best term rates on your new boat purchase? If you need financing for that new boat, call us today. We guarantee the best price, best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine also carries all the gear that you will need. Everything from auxiliary kicker motors to fishing tackle and bait. Defiance Marine has certified technicians that are top-notch at their job. Some of the best in the Pacific Northwest at evaluating your boat issues and problems. Stop in today or give us a call for all your needs at Defiance Marine. Today, the need for quality private security services is at an all-time high. Contract Security Service provides day-to-day -day peace of mind as they protect people and property. Here at Phoenix, we provide service for multiple state and federal contracts with services ranging from uniform, patrol, alarm monitoring, canine detection, executive protection, as well as investigative work. Phoenix client management models are built on understanding our client's security needs and responding with a tailored program that is best fit for them. Phoenix provides excellent customer service through well-trained, highly motivated security professionals. Recruiting highly qualified officers is the first step in building a strong team. Currently, we are comprised of 70% prior law enforcement and military veterans. If you are prior military or law enforcement, go to www.phoenixprotectivecorps.com and apply today. Hey, welcome back, Fish on Northwest. Wayne England, Tommy Dolan in the studio here this evening. Thanks for everybody jumping on as of mm -hmm. late. Numbers are uh, creeping up there. Tommy, got a lot of folks tuning in tonight. Lots of good questions. Uh, yes, indeed. Greg Hale is tuning in too. And he says, when are you going to start talking about Springers? We're on our second margarita. We're going to wait till you hit number four. Yeah, it'll be around the number four mark. And then buddy. it all makes sense. And then you get really excited about Springer fish. You're like, this sounds like the greatest fish we ever created. And then you'll forget what you learned tonight. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Travis, yeah, that is bull. Uh, the Skokoma should be opened. Uh, again, land dispute. It's at the federal level. WDFW has pushed it up to the feds. There's where it sits. If, uh, if you had joined us... Uh, for those of you who have, and we've talked about it pretty extensively, uh, even as, you know, a few months ago, going into North of Falcon, it was concerning that uh, some of the elders at the Skokomish tribe had, had gone on record to say, if WDFW does not pull back from this land dispute, uh, they're not so sure that they're going to be signing on to the list of agreed to fisheries. And we talked about the impact that may have on North of Falcon, and the outcome and our ability or our opportunity to actually go fish if we can't mm -hmm. have the tribes collectively uh, all sign on a list agreed to fisheries. So you you think you fish and you don't want to hear politics and you don't want to get involved in this stuff. But you have to. You just you cannot just turn a blind eye to it if you're uneducated about this stuff. That's why we try to delve into it a little bit each and every week and help educate the masses because collectively, Tommy, we all mm -hmm. need to understand what's going on so we can stand up for ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of, uh, you know, a little segue there into what's going on as of late. We have had both parties involved on our show. 
Yes. Ron yep. Garner is president of PSA. Been friends with him for a long time. Mm -hmm. Hell of a fisherman. Has done a lot for the Puget Sound. He is and Nia Bay, by the way. And Nia Bay. Oh, yeah. Very knowledgeable yeah. gentleman in all facets of fishing. Has been at the table negotiating drafting seasons, negotiates allies and friends with the tribes. The removal of the, uh, the HSRG uh, was, you know, no small task. He credited multiple tribes and elders mm -hmm. through the process, credited the commission mm -hmm. through the process, right? Ron is the first to step up and pat persons on the back mm -hmm. uh, when, when things go, uh, things go uh, in a positive manner for sure. Um, so we also have friends of the show and persons we've had on the show here mm -hmm. uh, with Fish Northwest. They launched... They made it known they were going to give a 60-day notice, and then they actually followed through with filing a, a lawsuit and then a second one in District 3 Court in Seattle. Right. Uh, the first one hinging on, they, they felt obligated, and they feel they have the data to support it in the years of imbalance to take it in and say, we want this to ha you know, land at a hearing with a judge. We can show you the documentation that shows over the years the allocation split that is uh, noted in the Bolt decision that most are well aware of on a 50-50 mm -hmm. margin. Uh, they, they are bringing documentation to show that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. In some cases, 35, 65, multiple years in a row. The interesting thing is, and I know you know this, if that goes on for two years in a row, and you can prove that, one side, and I don't care which side it is, if the tribes came to WDFW mm -hmm. and said, hey, you guys are overfishing your fisheries, you're in the penalty box. Right. The third year, there's a correction. There's a correction. Right. There's supposed to be a correction. Those discussions yeah. have never happened. No. As far as we've been led to believe and other folks in the industry I've talked to, those, mm -hmm. those conversations don't happen. I will go as far to say, and not trying to offend anybody, but I would I'd venture to say in most cases, the tribes probably overfish in some of these fisheries more so than the recreational fleet. Though, there are some fisheries that WDFW will point the finger in the chest and say, you guys are wrong. Recreational mm -hmm. fleet actually is pretty uh, impactful in this fishery or that fishery. Mm -hmm. And I get that. It kind of goes back. And there's to a big difference in all the fisheries too. It's not, you can't group the whole state together in this, no. this challenge here. You have to aggregate them out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, basically this comes down to, you have one entity fighting for what they feel is an in injustice and they want it heard and they want to get the balance back equitable share of both sides yep. and make sure that we're following the letter of the law. It's like the bold decision wasn't just put in place for the tribes. The mm -hmm. bold decision was put in place to ensure uh, fair seasons for all. Right. And yep. on our side, that includes recreational opportunity and <clears throat> non-tribal commercial. Mm -hmm. So people hear bold decision, they think, yeah, you know, well, that's, that's because the tribes, they got the bold decision. No, we all got the bold decision. Yeah. Whether you like it or not. So Fish Northwest is in a position to say, hey, we feel like this imbalance needs to be corrected. That's the first lawsuit. Second lawsuit goes down the road of permitting, mm -hmm. right? What do we know about Section 7? Yeah, so basically, as, as it stands today, um, we go on to the tribal permit in order to submit for our fisheries every year. Um, now, so the big concern here is with this lawsuit is the tribes may take this, um, you know, kind of as a direct attack on on them, on their fishery, on their permitting process. And so the concern is, you know, that is a when, when they allow us to go on their permit, that is a completely voluntary on their part. Mm -hmm. It's not a requirement. They don't have to allow us to use their permit. But as it stands today on the non tribal side of the house, on the sport fishing side of the house, we, we don't have our own permit. And if you talk to Noah and you talk to their West Coast administrator, Barry Tom, mm -hmm. he's going to tell you that that permitting process takes two years to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, two years from the beginning of when you request that permit. So if we asked for it tomorrow. Two years later, you would have it, right? And until and we the, have it in hand. You're not fishing. You're not fishing. You're not fishing because you don't have a permit. Because you don't have a permit. Right. Yes. So... We'll take everybody back to 2016. Jim Unsworth was our director of WDFW. They didn't like the direction the negotiations in NOF were going. They didn't like the seasons that were drafted by the co-managers to say, here you go, this is where we're at. 
uh, WDFW staff and those negotiating the terms of the agreement said, no, we're not doing it. And uh, to heck with it, we're gonna go get our own permit. And so the, the irony here in, is you really dig back historically and try to figure out how did we get here? We had our own permit up to 2014, WDFW. Mm -hmm. And I've been led to believe that those are 10 year increments, right? So you get that permit in hand, it's a 10 year deal. So that tells me from 2004 to 2014, we had a permit, mm -hmm. tribes had their permit. What is their permitting all about? Well, you have to ensure based on NOAA's check boxes and yep. ESA recognized listings and all those mm -hmm. conservation restraints and constraints that you draft fisheries because it's a, it's a put and take fishery, but we're also protecting wild fish. So how do we craft these fisheries that allow us to have time on the water, execute these fisheries, take a percentage of those fish out, they go into the coolers, and we're still allowing for a reasonable or try to maximize the uh, wild fish return mm -hmm. in abundance, okay? So that's what all these fisheries are you know, drawn up around is protection of wild fish uh, and to get the hatchery fish out of the water so we don't have a stray spawning all over the place and screwing everything up for everybody like we did for years. Right. Um, NOAA has to sign off on it. Uh, again, you have to fall within the ESA compliance and there's a lot of uh, check boxes there. And so if you present them with fisheries that meet all those, okay, here's your permit. You guys can go fishing. Yeah. Why we lost hours or it expired and WDFW and staff or whoever's involved with that didn't go back after that at that time and just whatever that yeah. meeting sounds like between them and the co-managers say, well, we'll just jump on your permit. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I, I will say that in the coming shows, we're definitely, after the North of Falcon yes. process, we are definitely going to try to get um, somebody from WDFW to come in and explain this permitting process a little bit more yep. and, and help us understand why we went away from uh, our permit and why we have this joint permit yep. situation. So um, uh, letters have been fired off. Uh, there's, there's, you know, I, I refer to it as social media banter going back and forth. It's a he said, she said. We have much respect and hold folks in high regard on both sides of the coin here, mm -hmm. okay? Well, and they're, they're actually friends too. I mean, I don't know if they're still friends today, Yeah. but, but they, they were definitely friends going into this. Look, the one thing we can uh, agree on is everybody wants more hatchery fish. Yeah. And everybody right. wants more opportunity on the water. And it frustrates you and I, Tommy, to no end that we have PSA, NSIA, CCA, uh, Hatchery and Wild, yep. uh, Fish Northwest, the you list name goes, it, the list goes on. Right? Yeah. And we've named them all before. Yep. And we have said, we have an open format here. We will talk to all these groups. We allow mm -hmm. them to talk about what is near and dear to them, what their uh, goals and objectives are. And this group over here may not agree with this group's priorities. Mm -hmm. That's why my goal is to bring all these heads together in one room and say, we're going to prioritize the top 10 priorities yeah. for the Northwest recovery. And uh, for the next five years, we're going to focus on the top three that mm -hmm. everybody agrees to. I know it's a long shot. Mm -hmm. It's called a uh, consolidation. It's called a, a merger of the mind, right. if you will. Will it ever happen? I don't know. I guess, but, I guess the thing that's interesting in this is that, um, you know, Fish Northwest is bringing, this, bringing these two lawsuits and trying to get an injunction um, now. And, and I, I really, I think that's the part that really bothers me because bringing an injunction now at this point, it's right during when we need North to Italian. work with the tribes to set the season. And trust me, you, you're not, you're not getting a season without the tribes and it is a working together atmosphere completely. Um, there's a lot of negotiation, a lot of working together to provide fishery opportunities on both sides of the house. And, and you're never going to get away with that. Um, and so why now? Because when we, if, if an injunction is granted, there's a good chance either we don't get our season this year or it's going to be very late and we're going to miss opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's my big concern. So leaning heavy on the information f being put out there from PSA, that's the, that's the mindset. That's, mm -hmm. that's the narrative. You, you talk to the guys over at Fish Northwest, they're like, no, that's not true. We're well, not they, 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 they actually... actually they did acknowledge, Brett did acknowledge that it could delay this season. It could delay this season. Yeah. You are correct in that right. regard. Yeah. So, you know, again, guys, we're not, we're not lobbying for either side. We're just uh, putting it out there. Look, if you want to read all the finite details of going back and forth between uh, uh, PSA President uh, Ron Garner 
and Brett over at uh, Fish Northwest. I'm not saying, hey, go check out their, uh, their, you know, their, their, their point counterpoint. Point counterpoint. Um, but you can. You go to Fish Northwest on their Facebook page. You go to you go to Peter Sound Anglers. Um, you can read up on this stuff. Why? To get educated on the processes that are happening now. This is mm -hmm. current time, mm -hmm. right? And we have a differences of opinion. We all need to land in an area of, of success in that. We want our fisheries. We want more hatchery fish. <clears throat> we, want, uh, we want the monies that have been allocated for the orca recovery plan to get dumped into these hatchery programs, these net yep. pen programs, and these blackmouth programs, and these springer programs. And we and want crank those- them. Huh? Yeah, crank them out. Yeah, man. And we want Let's those go. fish put in, right? So it is, uh, it is uh, critical that these groups begin to work together. Hey, Chase Gunnell checking in this evening. I appreciate you checking it out. Um, uh, Conservation Northwest, Chase is immersed into this stuff. He's a good guy just to bring in to give clarity to all this stuff from, a, from another perspective, looking at all these other groups, right? So mm -hmm. we're in contact with all these groups as much as we can. We try, to, we try to bring clarity. I don't know if this helped with any clarity, more so just putting it out there for you guys to go seek out and take a look at. So, all right, gonna jump out for a break. Tommy, uh, we come back, it is time to talk some Springer fishing. There you go, Greg Hale. We're gonna talk Springer fishing. <laughs> Next uh, segment. Yep. Top off that drink. <laughs> throw a little slush in the old mixer, and uh, we are. We're gonna get uh, gonna get Mike Surik on the phone. Talk about the success they found, how they did it. We're taking notes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chris knows what he's doing. I'm not worried about it tomorrow, but <laughs> it'll be good. And I want to talk to Surik about how fabulous that Springer tasted because that picture he oh, put yeah. on that the grill. Oh yeah, that was primo. He did a good job flaying that too. Yeah, he probably had his dad do it. His dad did. Yeah, his it. dad did it. He still uses the training <laughs> wheels on the knife. All right, jumping out for. Quick break with Mike Sturdick on the phone. We come back right here, Fish on Northwest. Co. and Outdoor Emporium is the largest local outfitter in the Northwest since 1975, providing thousands of people affordable outdoor gear. This summer, make your next outdoor adventure more affordable by shopping at our warehouse style pricing. We are a local Scotty dealer offering sales, service, and repair. Located in Fife and Seattle, come visit us today the outdoors awaits you. It's easier than ever to browse homes and connect with an agent on the go with Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate's mobile app. With the app, your home search is synced across all of your devices, so you can pick up your home search anytime, anywhere. Take full advantage of an enriched, mobile-optimized map search experience. Use location services to quickly find homes near you that match your search criteria. Draw your own map boundaries to find homes in a specific area, and apply layers to view school districts, neighborhoods, zip codes, and more. The app's user-friendly design makes it easier than ever to find a home you'll love. Narrow down your search results, save your search criteria, and save your favorite homes. You can browse your saved homes in a list view that puts photos and key details, like price and square footage, right at your fingertips or check out your saved homes displayed on the map. Yep, for sure. Oh yeah, big fish. Yeah, buddy, nice fish. Oh, beauty, gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, good. oh. Oh geez, come on. Nice fish. Nice fish.
Hey, welcome back to Fish Show Northwest. Wayne England, Tommy Donlin, Ian Studio. This segment presented by Better Homes and Gardens, Pacific Commons Real Estate, located in Puyallup, Washington, Tommy. Thank you, Dwayne. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> just happened? Uh, hey, speaking of which, so Springer Fishing on the Columbia River. We are going to go partake in that tomorrow. The weather looks favorable. We got anywhere from a five to maybe eight percent chance of rain. Eight. Eight. eight not eight, eight zero. Not eight. Yeah. 8% chance yeah. of rain, which uh, would be abnormal for me because the last couple of times I've gone fishing. You've gotten hammered. Oh my God. Yeah. Monsoon, windstorms, whatever. We still get fish, but you know, I want a nice, comfortable, relaxing day like the gentleman we have currently on the phone, yeah. Mike Serdic, uh, Ray Marine, a regional sales manager and friend of ours, uh, Springer uh, Sensei. Is oh what yeah. Is, huh? That's a good one. I was going to say Springer King, <laughs> but I like Springer Sensei Springer better. Springer Sensei. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, bud? Good, guys. Happy to be here. Uh, first and foremost, how did that Springer taste? Because that picture on yeah. the, off the grill looked amazing. A little sage on it there. It looked tasty. Yeah. Let's just say I've, I've had it three nights this week, and I'm <laughs> going to have it a fourth night tomorrow. Oh, man. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. Hey, got to watch that, gotta watch that uh, extra oil and omega-3s. They'll sneak up on you. Know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, that fish is so good, it almost tastes like it's infused with butter. Yeah. It's just, I, don't, yes. I hate freezing it. You know? Amazing. Yeah, for sure. Well, when yeah. you catch as many as you guys did, you have to freeze some of it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't want it to go bad. So yep. let's talk about that fisher, man. You guys get out there and hammered them for a couple of days, put some great numbers into the boat. Um, and let's face it. It's a tough fishery as it is each and every year. But yeah. this last couple of weeks here, man, it's not been is there's no way it's a give me. You got to you got to dial it in. So let's talk a little about how you guys kind of dialed it in from the start. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely, guys. You know, it. Springer fishing will make you humble, right? Yeah. Everybody knows that. You you grind all day for one fish, and if you get a couple fish, it's a great day. Mm -hmm. And this is probably our, our eighth or ninth year making the trip down, you know, when, when they open it. And um, we we just ran what we know. You know, we we, uh, we like to drag bottom when we troll, uh, you know, around, around Cath Lamech, Clifton Channel, Tennessee, Tennessee, Puget. We like to drag bottom. Um and it's really a cut plug game. You know, we, we tried running the teaser helmets and, and, and running some smaller baits, but uh, the, the cut plugs is just, it, it's just such a cut plug game down there. And the water conditions were really favorable. We had the, the clear water of the week before there, got some rain, so um, the water clarity wasn't as clear as before. And um, we, we caught them on, on uh, green baits, green chartreuse baits, using that pro gear. You know, baits look nuclear when you put them in the water. And, uh, and catching them on uh, green and red label herring. And then uh, as the day we got on, later in the afternoon, we just caught them on, on straight up straight up herring, no, no dye or nothing like that. But all and, cut uh, plug, huh? No matter the size of the herring? No matter the size, yeah. Either small, smaller cut plugs from the red red labels or even the, the green label cut plugs were, were getting bit. Um, and we run a little bit different setup. We, run, uh, we don't run a drop sinker. Um, you know, with a three-way swivel like some guys do, we we actually run spreader bars like you see when you go halibut fishing. We oh, actually, really? Yeah, we make our own spreader bars um, with about an eight-inch dropper on it. And what that does is it really allows you to, to to keep your stuff on the bottom without stuff getting tangled up. You know, that mm. there's so many humps in the river there. You know, you see it on your mm -hmm. sonar where yeah. the, the the fish just hold in those humps and when you're dragging bottom with those spreader bars, it just, it puts your baits right in the bottom of those humps. Your fish flash keeps spinning and your bait just twirls right through there. And, um, yeah, we were fortunate enough to, to catch fish, uh, in the first thing in the morning, caught them, uh, middle of the day. We caught fish at six thirty at night. So, nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. now, are you noticing time. Mike, when you, when you guys are trolling, do you notice that troll direction matters and are you ever going cross current are you always going with the current? How, how does that work for you guys? Yeah, yeah. I mean, typically, um, you, you know, you're always trolling downhill. Um, there's a few times in the day where the tidal stands still and there's some frog water that you can get in and, and, and do some zigzags. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, trolling downhill and, and just kind of I'm picking a contour line. You know, there's some spots there where you get four or five feet of water if you don't, you know, pay attention to your chart. So mm -hmm. we, we would try and, and stick around that 10 to 12 to 15 feet of water. I think we caught a couple fish in eight feet of water too on the, on the low water at the bottom of Clifton. So yeah, it, it's really just uh, following my charts. And, and I, I'll, I'll say this, you know, from being a saltwater guy, 
you know, from the San Juan to Mia Bay and, and fishing in a hundred to 200 feet of water, it, there's just something to be said about going over a spring Chinook in eight feet and marking them on the sonar <laughs> and, and yeah. literally doing, doing the countdown until you get bit and, and more. I can't remember how many times it happened. It's just like, Oh, there's a fish. One thousand, two one thousand, boom! Smash <laughs> that is bag. awesome. Yeah. The what, right so what, what's this? Talk to us about the settings a little bit that you're using um, on your sonar, and you're running, you're running the Raymarine Axiom Pro yep. on yep. the back deck there. I love where you've mounted that location. That screen. Is great. Yeah. That is key. Mm-hmm. But talk to us a little bit about settings. I think one of the things we want to get dialed, people dialed into this year, is how you actually set up that sonar for success. And setting it up for deep water is a lot different than setting it up for 10 to 12 feet for springers in the Columbia River. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know, we, we actually toyed around with the sonar uh, quite a bit. And, you know, there was some discussion on the boat of, of maybe you can turn the big one kilowatt transducer off mm-hmm. um, and, and just running the, the RV100, you know, 600 watt trip transducer. Mm. Um, so we, we kind of went back and forth. We, we actually lowered, you know, the power to the transducers, right? You don't need to be banging at a, a full hundred percent power to those AMR transducers. And, um, and, and honestly, Tommy, we, we, we went through that and, and we actually ended up setting everything in auto on the system and, and smart fish and caught fish. You know, we, we thought about tuning the sensitivity and the noise filter and the gain and the range. And really uh, it's just, you know, the, 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 the cone angle underneath the bottom of the boat doesn't get much bigger than five or six feet, right? When you're right. out fishing in the salt water, yep. you know, sometimes you're looking at 60, 80, or 150 foot circle under the boat. But here we're, we're only looking at four five, six feet. So when you mark the fish, you get a pretty good picture. I mean, a 15 pound springer is about the size of your thumb when you're looking yeah. at mm. fishing in that water. So, and, and there's a lot of other little fish kicking around. There's a lot of jacks. There's a lot of, you know, trout and white fish and stuff like that. So, I, I did get a handful of calls over the weekend from guys saying, Hey, how do I know if these are springers? How do I know if they, you know what I'm marking here? And they would forward me pictures. And really you're, you're looking for that big red arch, right? It's got to have yep. some return on it. It, it, it. There's just no question when you see those marks that they're kings. Yeah. And I think what, what people need to realize too, is the length of the mark is not only the size of the fish, but it's also the amount of time that that fish spent in the beam. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like when we see our tuna on the screen, when we're offshore and you see something streak and that streak goes 20 feet in depth, you know, it's a tuna because how it's moving. Whereas your blue shark isn't going to make an upward streak like that. And you can really dial it in and know exactly what's underneath your boat that way. And I don't want to derail our Springer conversation. But I have to ask this question: When you're at Renfro, okay, across from New Bay, there on the Canadian side, are mm-hmm. you also are you also detuning your transducer and not hitting those fish with the full one k dub? You know, I, I, honestly, Tommy, I, I've I've tuned them up and down. There was a point in time where even up at Rivers Inlet, where we trolled, you know, thirty five feet of water to catch, you know, fifty sixty pound springs there was a discussion whether we're, we're the, the transducer is too loud, right? It's just mm-hmm. too much noise. And, and I have dialed it down and you still get a great performance, but I, I tell you, I think I'm, I'm proving the theory that, that it really, it, it might not matter as much as, as we think it does. Okay. You know, I think, I think it's putting, putting the bait in front of the fish. Um, you know, it we really it didn't seem to spook any fish. You know, we caught, we kept three or four Kings every day last, last weekend. And, I'll bet we had another three or four tries, you know, fish at the side of the boat that we couldn't mm-hmm. connect on. So, um, yeah, I, I, and really, it, you know, we use some of the side vision stuff too. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of snags and, and stuff you got to be aware of, you know, when you're fishing the Columbia. So, it, you know, anytime we got hung up on something, I just went to the plotter, dropped the waypoint. And, and just put a big red X there so we wouldn't get hung up on that stuff anymore. Yeah. You had trouble connecting. That's probably because you were running knuckle busters, huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 We got all kinds of funny looks. You know, we're the big, biggest glass boat down there. I know. With yeah. all, all the aluminum boats. And <laughs> hey. we're, we're running Islanders like it's nobody's business. Yeah. $800 Islanders that yeah. are pink and green and purple and blue. Fish box mm-hmm. speaks for yeah. itself. Hey, one thing I noticed, yep. Mike, as we're looking at that picture we put up there that I pulled off of your Facebook page uh, for the weekend you guys are down there. Water temp was just barely over 48 degrees. Did you guys have consistent water temps in around that 47, 48 degrees each day? Yeah, yeah. It actually, it got warmer every day we were there. Oh, nice. When we first got there, 
uh, it was uh, it was right around the 46, 47 mark. You okay. just gradually got got warmer when we were there. We, we were we were blessed to have some just totally nice weather a couple of days, right? It was blue sky, t-shirt yeah. weather. We did have some cold mornings with some rain and some fog and wind and stuff like that we dealt with. But yeah, I, I think the I think the fishing is going to get better. I know guys that that hammered them today. It sounds like it, it's it's really starting to pick up these next couple of days. So well, that's good because we only got a couple of days left. You know? Yeah, so, keep our fingers crossed. Yeah. Nice mm-hmm. Well, we're hoping to get down there tomorrow with a buddy and uh, take our day of sitting around trolling on the old Columbia and see if we can't find a few uh, for sure. So, um, yeah. did you guys did you uh, roll herring the entire time? Did you throw any anchovies in the mix, or was it herring all nope. the time? You know, it's funny. We we rolled herring probably ninety percent of the time, mm-hmm. and then we actually ran uh, sardines. We had some oh, some really ooh. good sardines uh, down there that we we threw in the the brine with the rest of the herring. And <laughs> believe it or not, we caught. Springers on cut plug sardines. They I spun, believe it. spun awesome. awesome. Yep. Nice yep. It was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. We're kind of the understanding down there. I want my bait twirling as fast as I can with as slow as I can go. So there was a lot of times where, you know, when the water was ebbing that there, we were just kicking in and out of neutral, right. And, and letting that bait just work. You know, we, we do some things with our baits where, you know, you cut plug them, um, you, you punch a hole through the anus so water can flow through the bait a little bit. We even take a pair of scissors and cut the point off, or cut the tails off, and and the bait just gets just a, a, a really crazy spin to it, you know. And um, it's, we left stinger hooks too. There sometimes we didn't even bury the bottom hook in the meat; just left the the hook, you know, tie an extra long leader so the the hook dangles off the back of the herring, you know, yeah. maybe an inch mm-hmm. or something. And uh, it, one of the things we do- talk about is when the, when you're getting bit and you see something chewing on your rod. Do you, uh, do you like to let him munch on it for a while and keep it in his mouth? How long do you let him do that for before you find some hooks, right? And mm-hmm. uh, we went back and forth on that theory. I actually fed one. I had one hit, go away, drop some line on it, kept feeding him, and after about 30 seconds, he finally came back for it. Oh, smashed nice. It. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, your dad says yeah. get weird trying things when you aren't getting bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, exactly. Turn everything <laughs> off. Turn everything yeah. off. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Just go weird get weird with it. Yeah. yeah. And does that include mm-hmm. the, the dubstep too, the Skrillex, or do you just keep that going? Yeah. No, I was on the radio. I was on the sticks all weekend, and we caught fish to Skrillex. We caught fish to George Strait. You name it, man. Oh, <laughs> hell yeah. All right. Well, yeah. I'll bring the Skrillex tomorrow because I know Dwayne doesn't have that in, in his collection. Yeah. Little skrill. It's yeah, a dubstep think, thing. Oh, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll play yeah. it for you I think tomorrow. A big, okay, there you go. A big, a big part of our trip, too, is we have guys, you know, buddies fishing the river, and every we were all kind of scattered about. And, you know, you got to maintain contact with people to see what's going on. And, you know, we were really trying not to chase radio fish. You know, you hear a yeah. couple fish get caught, but yeah. you're setting up for the bottom of a tide and somewhere you let you know how to fish. And uh, we kind of just stuck to our program. You know, if it wasn't all out crazy or something for us to leave, we would we would stick and stay. And uh, and that's, that's kind of how we produce our fish. You know, we right on stick, stick to our guns, stick and stay, and make them pay. Stick and stay, and make yes. them pay. And you yeah. know, mm-hmm. when you're finding them in eight to twelve foot of water, there's no reason to go anywhere else. So yeah. All yeah. right, Mike, fantastic man. Thanks for taking time to jump on with us tonight. I know uh, you've been making your uh, making your way around, and uh, folks asking you, and you're always come forthcoming with information. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, happy to share as well, guys. Yeah, nice work, brother. Yep. All right, we'll be in touch. Talk to you soon and have a great trip. Yep, have a good one, guys. All right, we'll see you. Yeah, bye. All right, Mike Sertic, always full of fantastic information, Tommy. Yes. And uh, as we always are, of course, running a bit behind, so I have a couple of guests lined up who are waiting patiently. Mm-hmm. Patiently. We have Callet Steelhead, Springers, and Summer Run Fish, apparently, to talk about. All in the same day, yeah. Yeah, we still got to get to our uh, turkey conversation with uh, Eric Broughton. So maybe I'll message a few folks here at the break just to make sure they're hanging on and not going to leave us hanging. Right. And uh, we will do that. So we'll jump out for a quick break. We come back, our buddy Bonner Daniels, and what is actually going on down there at the Callets? Some nice size steelhead too, man. Some pretty Mm -hmm. salt fish, 15 plus pounds getting caught. Uh, nice looking steel hit. So we'll do that uh, right here. Don't go anywhere too far. Quick commercial break. We'll be back right here at Fish on Northwest.
A Northwest favorite for almost 40 years, Arima boats are manufactured with pride right here in Bremerton, Washington. Arima Boats offers all of our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. With literally thousands of Arima boats on the water throughout the Pacific Northwest, Arima boats are a proven hull design that offers incredible fuel economy and all of the amenities that a serious angler is looking for. All Arima boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Arima boats are designed to maximize deck space while also providing ample seating. Contact us today at Arima Boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water. Hey, welcome back Fish of Northwest. We are uh, live as we are each and every week. Tommy, it's already 7 p.m. It's crazy. I told you this was going to happen. <laughs> I told you this was going to happen. Long-winded sub again. Uh, hey, longtime friend, a buddy I fished with uh, multiple times. Hell of a fisherman, and he's all over the state. The guy just goes everywhere, does all kinds of fisheries. Always appreciate his information. If you haven't heard from him before, get ready and uh, sit down and hold on because Bonner is... <laughs> This, this rendition of Bonner we're getting here at 7 p.m. at night is the same rendition of Bonner we used to get at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning when we were doing radio, dude. I'm telling you, people are like, what is that guy putting his coffee, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Bonner Daniels, Bonner's Fish on Adventures. How you been, buddy? I've been doing well, Dwayne. Uh, been working every day, fishing every day, and chasing them winter runs ever since the new year, and i uh, got a couple weeks left before it's over, yeah. unfortunately. Yep, then you're heading to the east side to get going on that uh, smallmouth and walleye program, right? So, Ooh, that would be nice. A little relaxation would be nice. Oh, and mm -hmm. sunshine, for sure. So let's talk about this uh, this Cowlitz fishery. You know, um, historically, I mean, back in the day, let's face it, that Cowlitz fishery was uh, one that many, many people participated in. And, uh, you know, that run was established. Uh, you could always look forward to it starting after Thanksgiving through the winter time, December, January, trickling on into February. Then they made a huge change several years ago. That fishery pretty much is a March, April, maybe the front edge of May. Uh, April should be go time. Um, how is that? How's it been performing for you? You've been fishing not just there, obviously, since January, but since you've gotten out of the drift boat, got back to the power boat and been on the Cowlitz, you know, how's that fishery performing this year for you? So, you just gave a lot of questions there and a lot no, of information. No, that's one question. That was a little history it, walk it, and now it's <laughs> one question. Yeah. How's this sound? I will give you guys the biggest bone you could ever have. Everybody has the internet, everybody has a computer. CalisRiverLive.com or whatever the live report. Yeah, yeah. Go to there. It shows the annual report for the 10 years. Is there's a graph button? Hit it. Oh, yeah. Nobody knows how to hit that freaking button. It'll answer all Dwayne's questions right there. It'll show you that the fish actually had started in January mm -hmm. and uh, they trickle through from February all the way into March and they peak in April. Okay. And uh, nobody really realizes that because they don't hit that button. I don't oh. know how to hit the button. I'm just a redneck. I even hit the button. You got to hit the button. But uh, that fish we started out with a lot of big chrome bright fish back in January. Mm. Not very many one two three a day every once in a while you'd crush them and then go for a zero the next day um right now the fish are still in there um you just gotta fish hard for them man there's so many good fishermen how you said there's not as many people fishing eh, i beg to differ mm. there's so many people down there you only got the big sea or the little sea it's all you got yeah and uh um i will i'm gonna say this with a grain of salt you'll get humbled the best guys in any given day will get humbled down there but guess what the next day you will be the king mm -hmm. it just is what it is you just got to go and grind it out um uh how am i gonna say this so there's uh there's quite a few fish in there to be honest with you but you just got to grind them you just got to go down there and throw your little circles throw your little beads throw your little eggs throw your little shrimp and just go grind all those holes down there at the river's gorgeous uh you can see the bottom about four foot of water oh, nice. super green about five to feet or deeper so the fish are right where they should be it's pretty obvious where they should be especially when the sun comes out right and you just gotta grind it i guess is the best way to say it. it's like springer fishing he's got to go in circles what's the uh <laughs> what's what's your go-to nowadays are you still a hard uh, die hard uh, side drifting kind of presentation you do a little more bobber dogging you do any bobber dogging i mean what's what's kind of in the uh the arsenal now to so, locate these fish and get them 
so so this year, like straight up, like this year, for whatever reason, the plug show is not going. It's just not. So the side drifting show is the go. And I watch Old Man Jam. I watch Plugger Ace. I watch the Callus Plugger. I watch them all. And they're just not doing well. But the side drift guys are getting them barber dogging or side drifting. It does not matter. I'm telling you right now, whatever your favorite method is to do it. And you're going to hate me saying this. But everybody knows it. Those little circles. Any kind of bead you can find, hard or soft, it don't matter. Mm. King corns are red. Fire it up river and hold on. <laughs> some guys catch them on 20 mils. Some guys catch them on 10 mils. It's yeah. just, man, it's a, it's a conveyor belt fishery. It is what it is. You just got to right. keep grinding. It's like being in Vegas. You just got to pull the slot. You uh, keep pulling it. And you fish more hard beads or soft beads? Doesn't matter. I wish I wish I could tell you one worked better than the other because I'd only use one of those two, but yeah. I have to use both because any given day, it might be orange one day, it might be red the next day, and sure. all of a sudden it's a Sharice bite. Mm. And it's just weird. And you should bring eggs. You always bring eggs just in case. I got eggs in my boat every day. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying they catch them every day, but you should bring them with you. Um, I mean, as politely as I can say this, you got to be a good fisherman right now to catch fish down there. Huh? <laughs> as politely as well, I can say it. If, the the uh, gomers just aren't getting them. If we're side it's not drifting, the way it though, works. If, as a guide, from your perspective, back there on the motor, you know, back in that boat down river, watching everybody's rod tips, you see your clients miss fish every day. They think it's bottom. You there? Yeah. I'm going to say... I'm not saying they're going to miss fish. I'm going to say you got to make the right cast in the right spot. Cause you only live in certain spots. If you don't you make know. that cast in there, you're just not going to catch them. Mm-hmm. And with my job, if guys aren't working as a team, it just doesn't work. But if you're a solo guy and you go down there and you make those right casts, you, you might make the right cast 100 times catch nothing. All of a sudden, 101, boom, you got one. 102, you got one. Are you the world's greatest fisherman? I don't know. You made two good casts. It's literally a conveyor belt fishery. You just got to go and grind it. It's not like it used to be. You can't just go crush them. It's just, it's just not like that. There's the best fishermen in the world are all down there right now. And so good luck. Well, you like you said. know what you're doing. Yeah, limited opportunity, right? You guys want to get steelhead right now? We have very limited opportunity and accessibility. Yeah. This is one that I go into the spring. But uh, you guys actually pulled a springer out the other day. And uh, what, you, uh, what you are convinced is uh, first summer run of the season. Well, I guarantee you we caught a summer in yeah. and a, a springer. Uh, was that yesterday? So uh, before April, we got on the board with both of those, which is always pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't expect to catch a bunch of summer runs, but I know for a fact at least a handful of them have been caught already. Yeah. And that's great news. Great news for the summer guys. Great news for those guys. And then the springers you can't keep, so it's bittersweet when you catch one. But I'll tell you what, if you get one, that's the fight of your life, and it is awesome on that <laughs> side. Here. Lion does not want to let that fish go. Oh, you yeah. See that picture? Not. <laughs> he is not willing to throw that one back. It's like you're saying, hey, dude, really, you got to yeah. let this go. We got to put it back now, right? <laughs> you, you, you get good tips at the end of that fight, I'll tell you that yeah. much. <laughs> but, uh, you know, let's face it, spring Springers are finicky. Uh, oftentimes it takes pretty good bait to get those fish. Did you get that thing to go on a bead? I cannot tell a lie. Yes, I did. Yeah, I believe it. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln style. Yes, we did on a bead. Okay. Uh, on, however weird the sounds, if you go look at any snag in that whole entire river, any snag, any log, it looks like Christmas and everybody has little beads on. There's nobody throwing yarn. Mm. People might throw eggs a little bit. But otherwise, every single person in the planet is throwing a bead on the Cows River. Let's so roll, let's anybody roll. out there can figure out something that's better, that works better, I would love to talk to them personally. Real quick, let's <laughs> run through the uh, through the rig up. For those that maybe haven't side drifted okay. a whole lot, let's talk about, you know, uh, the amount of weight, type of rigging you're using, size of hook, length of leader, all that. So, so how's this sound? On Golden Ticket Tuesday, they raise the water every week on Tuesday, so you got to bump your weight up on a little bit. So let's say every day from <laughs> Wednesday through Monday when they don't raise the water, unless it rains a bunch, you probably want anywhere from an inch and a half to two inches of weight. If you're fishing the gravel bar side, probably a little bit less. If you're fishing the deep water side, a little bit more. Um, I like the single bead personally, but the double bead is pretty damn effective. And you probably want about two feet between your beads and probably about four foot to five foot on the first bead somewhere in there. Okay. And, and you got to cast up river. That's super important. You got to cast up river. If you don't cast up river, you're not going to catch anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's literally it. And then pink, red, or orange. And I put every color on the rods and you pick them. And once the guy catches two in a row and one, everybody wants that color and you kind of go from there. Sure. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's literally it. And upriver is probably the most important thing that I could tell anybody on that. Right. 45 upriver and drag her on down. What, uh, what do you got? A little bit of uh, advice for uh, first timers. Believe it or not, there are people that still get down to the couch for the first time, right? 
Uh, let's step out of the oh power boat. Let's step out of the power boat for a minute. Let's uh, for the drift boaters. Um, give some advice for guys or gals that are going to go down there in a drift boat, spend a day. Uh, don't go. A, it's don't a conveyor belt fishery. Right? <laughs> don't it's go. a conveyor belt oh, fishery, <laughs> but I'm in a drift boat. Bonnie, what do you got for me? Oh, Jesus, Dwayne. Um, oh my God, Put don't go. Spot, Otherwise. Man. I would go from Barrier Dam down to Blue Creek or from Blue Creek down to Mission. Yep. And once you get by that mile of hell of us and the jet sleds, then you'll be in peaceful water again. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of fish going to Barrier Dam that nobody touches. Nobody touches those yeah. fish. And so, and if I was going to do that, I would, if I was say an eight hour day, I'd spend at least six hours of it in the top mile or two. Yeah. At least so that's where they're coming. It's like hunting deer in the alfalfa field. They're going to come your way, right? So why, why, why go chasing the drift boat? Now you're talking Tommy's language. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, uh, there you go, Tommy. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Exactly. No, you know I'm what? A hunter. Uh, hey, I asked I'm a hunter, for a, for sure. I asked for a takeaway for drift boaters, and that's one thing, one key point in uh, uh, nicely stated. Okay, that, I'll give you this. Yep. Here you go, drift boaters. Here you go. Here you go. Here you go. So when you get below Gr Blue, Blue Creek, when you get down there by the A-frame hole and all that stuff, those inside edges, go swing your flies. No three little bobbers and drift. It's for you, Kyle. You're gonna hate me for saying this. <laughs> 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 if you go, yeah. if you go do that down there, I know you'll catch him because I happen to know a guy that does that and he catches them. Sorry, Kyle. Right, Sorry. right, right. No, my point was gonna be, hey, my point was gonna be. You said, you know what? Focus on barrier down. A lot of people don't even understand well, yeah, the fact going they, there. they got, you know, their their sights are set. Oh, go Blue Creek, go down a mission. Yeah. This boat, man, put in a barrier. Spend your day up there yeah. above the boats, yeah. above the above the power boats, and take your time. Work yep. that water all the way down. You're going to find and fish. Bring plugs and coon shrimp with you. Run, you run, 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 yes. run your uh, if you're in drift boat. I guess get a two rod permit on that river. Yeah, yeah. So so run two and two, two yes. plugs, two coon. There you're you an idiot. I shouldn't think you're an idiot. You're a fool if you don't do that. If you hey. don't run two and two. I think you're doing yourself wrong. You are. Uh, you were heading to the east side after a couple of weeks. Uh, you're typically booked up. You got any openings to finish out your Cowlitz time, and then after that, are you taking bookings for your walleye trips over on the east side? The Cowlitz stuff. I appreciate that, Dwayne, very much. I've been booked out on that. But yep. if anybody wants to go catch a bunch of walleye for dinner, and we release our bass. You guys want to go do that? I do have some dates open on the potholes. I live there. I got a place there. My ashes go there. I got that place pretty dialed. So if you guys want to go do that, I got that. I got probably I got like four days left somewhere in there. So there's a few open in there. <laughs> Otherwise, I appreciate you asking that. I really do. Absolutely. So uh, best best way for folks to get in touch with you to come and book that uh, walleye trip. By the way. I'm going to call that number that you give me, and I'm going to book me a walleye trip because we're going to come over and film Ooh. some walleye and smallmouth fishing. Oh, we're going to have to blindfold some of us on that, though. But. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the, honestly, the best way to get a hold of me is just my phone number, which is 425-281-8772. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I don't yep. run the website things because there's no point. Right. And so I just take my phone, and then my email is my name. It's Bonner, and then fishon at gmail.com. And uh, if you call me during the day, I don't answer it, but I want to get up the river. I always call you back. So you yes, respect do. my clients. That's a guarantee. All you right, buddy. Way, uh, I don't have the phone on it. Always yeah. a pleasure. Can't wait to come catch some walleye. Looking forward to it. Hey, thank you guys so much for having me on. Love you guys. Go catch some fish. Fish on. Talk to you guys soon. Uh, All right, yeah, take care. Take care. We'll see you. Bonner Daniels never disappoints. Like deer to the alfalfa. <laughs> like deer to the alfalfa. <laughs> he will get you lined up. All right, we are uh, jumping out for a quick break. Hey, that uh, that segment was presented by Phoenix Protective Corp, Tommy. Yes. And the reasons we are teamed up with them, you know, uh, not only are the owners uh, fantastic people, genuine, good-hearted people, but uh, they really strive for bringing folks on board with prior military mm -hmm. or police. Uh, experience. So if you're looking for work, if you are a retired military or spent a little bit of time in the service and are now looking for a line of work, look up, check out Phoenix Protective Corp. PhoenixProtectiveCorp.com and uh, apply. They're always hiring. They're a fantastic company to work for. Okay, jump out for a quick break. We come back. We're going to get Eric Broughton on the phone. Uh, Washington State Wild Turkey Hunting Club. You can find him on Facebook. Uh, we got a lot to talk about. You know, it is April 1st. Mm -hmm. We have the uh, youth opportunity coming up here um, this weekend. And then the 15th of April is the opener for Turkey. And so our plan is set in motion. We are going to be on the east side of the state the latter part of the month as we roll into the first part of uh, May. And uh, we got some turkey hunts that are definitely going to go down. And I can't, can't wait to team up Looking with this gentleman again. It. Yep. Yes. It's going to be good. So we will uh, we'll jump out for a quick break. We come back. Eric Broughton on the phone talking turkey before we close out the show here tonight. Fish on Northwest. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
The Fines boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why we back our boats with a lifetime warranty. All of our Defines boats come standard with large fish boxes that are fully insulated so that you can ice your fish properly all day. Defines boats feature a 21 to 22 degree dead rise at the transom and a large reverse chine for incredible handling and stability offshore. Defines boats are foam flotation filled and unsinkable for the ultimate in safety while fishing offshore. Defines boats feature fuel efficient hull designs with large fuel tank capacity so that you can have maximum fuel range for making long offshore runs completely safe and affordable. All Defines boats come standard with self bailing decks for improved safety while at sea. Defines boat offers all our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five year top to prop warranty from your Honda Outboard. Defines boats for all your boating needs and let us help you get out on the water. Today, the need for quality private security services is at an all time high. Contract Security Service provides day to day peace of mind as they protect people and property. Phoenix Protective Corporation strives for excellence. Above all, Phoenix security officers are managed by leaders trained to inspire and encourage greatness. Here at Phoenix, we provide service for multiple state and federal contracts with service ranging from uniform, patrol, alarm monitoring, canine detection, executive protection, as well as investigative work. We here at Phoenix are looking for highly motivated individuals to apply. If you're a vet, retired or active, and would like to work with us, please apply. Hey, welcome back Fish Out Northwest. We are uh, winding her down, Tommy, as mm. we say. We uh, have gotten through quite a bit of in info and intel tonight. Lots of folks tuning in. Wish I had time to answer all these questions. There's some good ones out there. There are some good ones. Gonna have to uh, get back to a few of these because they're worth uh, worth providing answers for. So uh, keep firing them off, guys. We will uh, we will catch up definitely at the end of the show tonight for sure. And you can always check back as those uh, live there on our social media. With that, I want to introduce uh, a gentleman that some of you actually met with us last summer in June when we were over on the east side out of Electric City there, staying at the. Um, Sky Deck, and we had our uh, invite for Kokanee and, and Triploid and Walleye, and Eric was gracious enough to come and uh, give us a phenomenal, phenomenal walleye talk. Really detailed, and uh, afterwards, he and I stood around for probably an hour, hour and a half talking before we got on the road to head to home. Shing sitting in the truck like, uh, I said, hey, I gotta go thank Eric again, because he gave such I'll a- I'll be right friend. there. I'll be right there. <laughs> Hour and a half later, she's like, seriously, Juan, right? Uh, but if right. you remember, Eric, we were talking, uh, we were talking walleye, we were talking walleye numbers, and kind of where, you know, some folks' uh, thoughts are uh, with the removal of limits, and you're kind of telling me <laughs> populations of walleye are not an issue, and, and, and then it, then it kind of bled over into turkey, and we're talking turkey, you're like, yeah, you turkey right. hunt? I go, man, I'd love to. And so lo and behold, guess what? Uh, you, uh, <laughs> by the way, are an admin uh, creator, also the Washington State Wild Turkey Hunting Club on Facebook, very active page. And this time of year, uh, for those that aren't paying attention, man, you are putting out a ton of photos, videos. You're getting some magnificent toms on there as you're out scouting. So that brings mm -hmm. us to talking to you this evening. Um, as we are rolling into today, April 1st, and we have two weeks until the general opener, and let's start right there, uh, if we could. Let's start with yeah. what should a guy be doing right now as we get ready for the next couple weeks and anticipate that opener? Well, you, you should be dusting off all your gear, you know, and buying your tags and stuff. The, you know, we have a, a really good spring. You know, this year we get to actually start on time yeah we're right around. and yeah. uh i yeah. mean uh we get two weeks uh more than we did last year yeah. so uh and this weekend youth opens uh youth turkey and uh, the kids you know they got ripped off last year so uh you know those parents are going to be out there uh taking their kids out uh this weekend 
And so uh, there's going to be a lot of good opportunities, a lot, a lot of birds. Uh, we have a lot of birds. The, mm-hmm. the, uh, the uh, breeding was phenomenal last year. You know, the, there was no social distancing going on last year for the turkeys. <laughs> With the turkeys, you know, huh? they, I mean, there's no hunters chasing them for two weeks, you know. Right. So, I mean, they did their thing, and, and uh, we're seeing the, the results of that. There's a lot of birds. Um, up north, we're, uh, you know, the snow's just coming off. Oh, we got large groups of turkeys on private and on public. Um, I'm seeing lots of, uh, you know, the, the pecking order with all the, the all, all the toms. You know, that they were all buddies a couple of weeks ago. Now they're all like, you know, squaring off and doing their dominance thing. So we have a lot of jakes running scared, a lot of young toms, and and uh, so if you, if you you should be getting all your turkey gear ready, you should be talking to landowners, trying to get your permission secured. Um, doing some scouting, you know, it's worth taking a trip on a weekend, just driving around and looking to see where the birds are doing. Uh, a lot of the birds are still lower on elevation. Um, I hunt in Lincoln County and up Lake Roosevelt a lot. And, uh, when I'm out there fishing, you know, the birds are still down, you know, lake level. Mm-hmm. Um, but as that snow starts to melt, you know, they might start to, you know, move up you know up towards Colville and Kettle Falls so we'll see a lot of uh, birds move up in elevation fall that snow line you know into May so uh, opening weekend though it looks you know to be pretty good I'm seeing a lot of breeding already going on with the hens so the toms are already already breeding hens which means a lot of those hens are going to be sitting on nests come uh, opening day so that means uh, a lot of uh, active Tom's looking for love, <laughs> and mm-hmm. if you're if you're saying the right thing in the right spot, you're going to be you know uh, able to call a few in. So um, I'm really looking forward to it. We have a big camp, and the guys are just you know we got two weeks taken away from us last yeah. year. So and everybody's stuck at home. They want to get out and do some walking and hunting and have some fun. You know. Amen to that. Yeah. So you've got so you kind of alluded to it a little bit the calling. So can you talk yeah. a little bit, Eric, about the calling sequence and how do you, t- how do you talk to these toms to get them riled up and get them to come into the call? Yeah. So early, early in the season, you know, when you have all these hens, you know, early in the morning, you know, your best chance is to find a, what I like to do is I like to go out the night before. So let's say it's the night before opener and I'm going to locate, you know, a roosting area. And I usually do that right before dark. I'll drive down the highway and I'll do a, an, an owl hoot or a woodpecker call or a coyote call or just something just to kind of get them to gobble. Once I figure out where they're kind of at, then I know kind of an area to start in the morning, right? So mm-hmm. then I'll move in on that roost tree, that roosting area in the morning, get pretty close and then just sit down and, and try to be quiet and maybe put a decoy out. Um, but just do some soft calling. In the mornings, you really want to do some soft yelping. There's just like a four four yelps. Um I got, I don't know if this will be too loud, but I got a, I got a Phelps call with me right here. Yeah, and, uh, let's hear it. Yeah, you go. All right. So this is what I would do um, early in the morning. It would be a. And just something really soft. And that just kind of lets the Toms know where you're kind of at. And that's really all you need to do. You don't really need to have a, you know, calling contest sitting at that tree, those toms can pick you out. And, uh, so in the morning they're going to fly down, they're going to, you know, mess around with what hens they have. But you know, if you're saying the right thing, they're going to come your way. Mm -hmm. And even some of those hens might come your way to check out that new girl sitting over there in the woods. So, (laughs) you know, that, and that's kind of, they want that company because these toms, you know, they're chasing these hens for the last three weeks. So, you know, that's kind of where we're at with the early season is you get into May and, uh, you know, er, you know, later into April when these hens start dropping off and nesting those toms, the afternoon hunting is phenomenal. Mm. I, I usually kill, I kill probably 85% of my turkeys between the times of 11 and three o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, really? The morning hunts are great. I, 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 I'll pick up a few toms, but what happens in the afternoon is these net, these hens will, they have to go lay an egg, right? So they, they take off and they lose those toms, you know, around nine, nine thirty, ten, And they, uh, they, those toms are like, Hey, where'd the hen go? And they're off at their, you know, going to the nest and, uh, they're going to 
spend all day laying that egg. And then these toms are kind of walking around going, Hey, where's everybody at? You know, all these hens are gone. So, right. so they're looking, they're looking. And then all of a sudden there you are, you know, a lot of, a lot of hunters are, they're back at, at the cafe eating breakfast. Maybe they got mm-hmm. lucky that morning, but you know, I do really well in the afternoon. And so, uh, I spend as much time as I can in the afternoon and we do really well. Um, we got a lot of birds, uh, over the years, you know, right around lunchtime. So, uh, and these toms are just out there looking, cruising the woods, looking for love. And, and you're, if you're right in the right spot, you're going to have uh, a good time. So, so you're, you're, uh, you know, working in towards mid season, these, uh, these hens are, uh, laying eggs, <clears throat> getting on the nest. These toms are still out looking. They still want to breed with uh, new hens or hens that aren't, uh, you know, nested up yet. So they're cruising. It sounds like they're cruising a lot more. And you're setting up. Are you setting up uh, hen decoys and then doing soft uh, hen calls, just trying to draw those toms off the hill or whatever, bring them down kind of where you're uh, set up? Are you uh, you out on foot also trying to uh, scout and lo- locate some some of them toms and then uh, try to draw them in? What's kind of the what's the approach on that? Yeah, so I usually carry a decoy with me, and a lot of times, um, you know, if it's it depends on the area you're hunting. If you're hunting like bagged areas, you know, where you have that semi broken woods and you know wheat fields and stuff like I hunt in Lincoln County, you know, a decoy really helps because they can visually see that bird out there, and so they'll come in. But uh, a lot of times when you're in the woods, like up in Kettle Falls, Colville. Yeah, it helps to have a decoy, but it's not always necessary. I I really like having that Tom kind of looking for me. And, uh, you know, and you know where he knows where you're at, you know, so, uh, when you get him fired up, but I'll, I'll be cruising these, these, uh, forest roads or, or, uh, you know, the back, back, uh, wood trails and stuff. And I'll just be doing a woodpecker call. I, that's how I start. And mm-hmm. our crow call, uh, Phelps makes a new crow call. Um, but I, I have a woodpecker call, a pie leader woodpecker call, and it's super loud and I'll get a bird to gobble mm-hmm. and I usually try to get them to shock gobble before I even make a, a peep as far as a hen talk. And uh, the reason for that is I, I want to know, I want him to show his cards first. So I'm going to cruise around. I'm going to find a bird that gobbles. Then I'm going to figure out where to set up. And then I'm going to, I'm going to then start calling and then I'll try to try to get him to come in. And usually uh, it's been really a successful way of, you know, hunting, but uh, you know, when you're, there's a, if you have a, a buddy with you, we do a lot of back and forth calling, you know, like there's two hens and oh, we'll yeah. talk to each other. There's lots of tactics you can use right. uh, just to try to get that those toms a little bit closer. When, uh, when do you decide to use a ground blind, if you go that route or not? I mean, some folks set up in a ground blind. I have for fall turkey before. Uh, I have not for uh, spring because I've been moving around and uh, trying to trying to locate and, and draw them in, you know, set up decoys and whatnot. But, uh, you know, I've done the ground blind thing in the fall. Some some set up that for springtime. What are your thoughts in that regard? Yeah, so the blind the blinds are awesome because they make they make them, like, well, super cool for fabric now, you know, that 360 fabric. Mm-hmm. I, I've used a couple of the double bowl blinds where, I mean, they're awesome. You can see really good out of them, so... And they don't, they hide your movement, right? Well, for the kid, like for the kid hunts this weekend, Mm -hmm. um, I'd be using a blind because kids love to move, right? And, and, (laughs) and it's hard. They're fidgeting fidgeting all over the place and you're trying to get them to do stuff. And so if, if I was hunting this weekend, I'd have a blind for sure. And then, and then, you know, archery guys, you know, it's really important to, you know, hide your movement too. So blinds are really good for that. But, um, if you uh, are really uh, fidgety and you can't sit still, you know, uh, like I'm getting up there in age. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm not always comfortable, you know, yeah. sitting where I'm sitting. So right. sometimes a blind is helpful too. So there's lots of different reasons and places you can use a blind, but sometimes it's the location, the location, like a, an ag field edge or a pinch point, just like you would look for deer hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, you would want to set that blind up to intercept these toms going from roost area to feeding area or, you know, vice versa. So, um, so just by putting up a blind and setting it up in the corner of a field or an alfalfa field where they like to hang out in the, in the morning and you can slip in there in the dark. I mean, they just, they just, they're great tools to be able to use. 
Uh, as you had mentioned, sure. you already got you already got some birds breeding, and uh, you know the toms are out strutting around trying to breed with hens already, based on weather conditions and whatnot. So I got two weeks before the uh, general opener. So if I'm going to get boots on the ground, say a couple times a week here over the next two weeks, kind of putting a plan together, uh, you know, do I want to make sure I don't do too much? I shouldn't be out there making all kinds of noise and calling and stuff and trying to get birds fired up or do I want to kind of make some noise and let them know I'm there? I mean, what's, what's my approach for even scouting and trying to dial in my program over the next two weeks? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, use a, uh, like a woodpecker call or a crow call or something like that while you're driving around trying to locate birds. You know, I would, you really don't need to call. I mean, yeah. practice your calling in your car, you know, or yeah. something, but you know, don't, don't educate birds. They, they're already smart enough, you know I mean? Yeah. So what I would do is I would, I would, uh, spend out those evenings, uh, you know, listening for birds because you're going to be, and then in the mornings, you know, the early, right. You know, the first couple of day, hours of daylight drive around in the, in those areas that, you know, there's turkeys and, and just see where they're hanging out, what kind of fields they're in, where they're at, what properties they're on. Uh, cause those are where you're going to be, uh, wanting to set up in the mornings. But in the, you know, when you're roosting birds, I'm like, I might drive 25 miles when I'm up in Kettle Falls, just driving forest service roads, you know, up on public land and I'll, and I'll do the, the coyote call or the owl call, mm -hmm. you know, on a, on a high mountain point and just try to get, you know, calling down into a Valley, just trying to get located a, a couple birds that nobody else knows where they're at, you know? And so you can be really successful just putting some gas in the truck and go out there in the evenings and try to roost a bird. Um, you know, the other way is to, uh, is to just uh, roll the dice, you know, and, and hunt where you've always hunted and try to, you know, there's a lot of guys that are like that that don't have time to scout. Sure. So uh, they're going to come over and, and just try to hit hit the woods, you know. So, um, but any way you do it, you know, it's going to be fun this spring. There's a ton of birds. I'm seeing a, a lot of a lot of activity out there already. And we did a poll this morning on the, on the, on the uh, Wild Turkey Hunting Club and, uh, just to see what uh, we did a virtual scouting uh, poll oh. and we basically uh, it was kind of cool because members could just kind of chime in wh what they're seeing out there and so we had you know uh, gobbler strutting and calling or, or, or a large groups of turkeys and and most of the guys are seeing large groups of turkeys which means you have a lot you know up north where you have the snow just leaving and things right. are a little bit later. Yeah. Um, we have really large groups of turkeys. So we have toms mixed with hens and jakes and right. they're still really haven't broken up for the spring. So, oh, okay. Good to know. Well, uh, where can folks, uh, if they want to jump on there and, you know, uh, hit the like button or, uh, join on there as a member, uh, request membership on your, uh, on your wild turkey page on Facebook, what are they looking for? Yeah, just go to Wild Turkey Hunting Club, Washington State Wild Turkey Hunting Club. Um, we got three good admins um, on there, and and uh, we got about nineteen hundred members, you know, statewide. And it's a it's a, a lot of fun. There's a lot of guys that have a lot of knowledge over the years, and we love sharing it with you. So perfect. Well, uh, we are definitely looking forward to trekking onto the east side, connecting with you, and uh, spend a few days over there and uh, chase some of these toms around and put a put a few in the bag that's for sure absolutely mm -hmm. i'm looking i'm looking forward to it guys awesome man well thanks eric All appreciate right. your time tonight and uh, really really good info we'll talk to you soon yeah thank you see you guys later all right there you go eric broughton uh yes uh one of the creators and admins on the washington state wild turkey hunting club on facebook check them out they got uh, some of the photos on there are just phenomenal and big oh, toms huge whole toms out. huge yeah. toms and some of the videos so yeah. i am really looking forward to that yeah that is, that's uh, gonna be a good one yeah it's gonna be a good time so uh yeah the youth openers this weekend for those that got your sights set on uh, getting out getting the youngsters out uh and as eric had mentioned um a lot of birds you know last year we barely put a dent in them with that shortened season way late season mm -hmm. started way late kids didn't have an opportunity i mean they did but they didn't have the recognized youth opener right yeah so uh you know great opportunity to get them out there this year for sure we got a full season we got two extra weeks um it's it's going to be good lots of birds so all right, we're going to jump out for our final break. Tommy, we're going to come back we're either going to close out the show or we're going to talk a little boat safety we'll decide at the break so don't go anywhere uh, you may miss it. You might miss Tommy. You might Don't miss it. it. Don't miss it. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here at Fish on Northwest right after this break.
Allied boats are built by West Coast fishermen for West Coast fishermen. Deep V 21 degree dead rise at the transom guarantees a smooth ride no matter the conditions. Allied offers all of our boats with Honda outboard packages so that you can take full advantage of the reliability and five year top to prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Allied boats range from 19 to 32 foot in length, so no matter what type of heavy gauge boat you are looking for, we have it for you. All of our Corsair 21 foot and larger designs come standard with reverse chine that is welded inside and out with no extrusions below the waterline so that you will never have to worry about corrosion problems down the road. Get out on the water today in a boat that you can trust and enjoy with Allied Boats. Contact us at Allied Boats today to learn much more about our incredible fishing machines. New days, new beginnings, new friends, new loves, new dreams, new goals, new scenery, new job. No matter what the next chapter holds, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate will be there to help you find the new that's right for your lifestyle at any stage of your life. Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Expect better. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> We're back in studio. And we did decide that we are going to, because it's such an important topic of boating safety and, um, you know, going offshore, kind of some considerations for safety gear. I want to throw out a couple scenarios. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. want to truncate it tonight. I don't want you to either. Um, no. So we're going to save that for next week. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a good call. So, hey, I want to thank everybody for uh, jumping on here tonight. We had a fantastic showing, of course. Lots of good questions. We'll uh, we'll jump back on a few of those and answer. So appreciate everybody chiming in, saying great show. We are uh, trying hard each and every week, Tommy, yeah. to bring uh, fresh and relevant, relevant information, not just keep yeah. going down the same path and talking about one or two topics yeah. only, right? We like to bounce it around here. So, well, and so the other thing I do want to mention is we're really trying to get the YouTube channel to take off. And so we do appreciate, um, if you jump over to the YouTube side of the house, mm -hmm. like subscribe, mm -hmm. that really helps us. Um, it's been a grind for us lately. I mean, yeah. Dwayne got off work at what? 2 AM this morning. Well, or? no, I got off at seven, but I was up all, you know, but you were, you were up until three in the morning. Yeah. yeah. So it's um, just, you know, some weeks are tough for others. I'll tell you yeah, that much, right? We're yeah. still both working full time and trying to pull yeah. this off. So yeah, any assistance on our YouTube channel, it's starting to grow. We're starting to get, I mean, literally answering questions and comments over there almost mm -hmm. daily, which is encouraging. We really want to see that thing take off. So please take we our yeah. YouTube content, push that around, send it to all your friends. Let's help us build those numbers there as well. Our Facebook platform's doing well. It's, I mean, we just surpassed two years now here at Fish on Northwest yeah. in March, mid-March was our two year mark. And we're over 13,000 followers on Facebook, which is great. We'll be at 20,000 in no time. We can look forward to that, but we really, really want to get that going over on our YouTube channel and blow sure. that up as well. So yep. we will continue to bring you so much content over the next several, several months through the rest of this year. We're gonna have both boats out on the water. We have a ton of filming to do in the field. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're gonna cover hunting way more in depth this year than, uh, than we have previous years. We have some really good, exciting things happening and some partnerships taken off. Gonna bring you some really good stuff here in the next yeah. couple of weeks too. It's gonna be pretty exciting. Yeah, we're gonna go full tilt on the ocean fisheries. So that's oh, gonna be pretty exciting. Oh man, so yeah. lots of good stuff coming forward. Uh, if you have content, questions, uh, need some how to, some advice, some some just questions in general, or you know, some things you want to see us do, especially in the how to bait lab or out yeah. in the water or in the woods, uh, hit us up on Messenger. 
You can always hit us on Messenger uh, and uh, throw those questions out there. We answer everyone that we can, and we also will take that information, bring it back here in studio, and turn it into a segment or try to help people out. Because if you're thinking it, more than one yep. person is for sure. And I saw one tonight that we'll have to do, and that's um, preparing for pinks. How do you fish pinks? Oh, salmon? yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's a good one. We'll get Got that one time. on the docket. We'll, we'll break that down both in saltwater, Tommy, and terminal areas. Yeah, absolutely. And it will not include flossing, by the way. Mm, no. <laughs> I no. will. We're going to let Josh do his first ever Yeah, yeah first ever how to. <laughs> you take a 10-foot leader. Yeah. Tie a piece of pink <laughs> yarn on it. And a uh, cannonball. I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, pounds. And yeah, so anyway. Uh, all right. want to thank everybody once again. And uh, yeah, keep the questions coming. We are here each and every week to bring you uh, relevant information. And we love doing so. Um, check out our Facebook page if you haven't. Check out our YouTube channel. And uh, follow us along. Give us a follow, a like, and all that. And share our content. We, yeah. are, uh, we are out of here for another week. And uh, we're going to Springer Fishing tomorrow. Amen. On Springer Fishing. I'm excited for go that. To our, go to our uh, website as well, please. Check out our website. Um, Shing's done an amazing job there with all our wares. We have so many different logo items. And, yeah. oh, wait till we unveil the new logo coming out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm oh, excited, man. This man. is a special one. We got some great yeah. new logos coming as well. We got right some new wares alley. already out there. We yeah. got a ton of stuff going on in the online store. Check it out. Plus, you get the jingling jigs all there as well. And read up on our content. We have more content we're going to be providing for our webpage in the near future. So, all right, that's enough with us here this evening. Have a great uh, week. Get out, get your pictures. Get those kids out turkey hunting. Post those pictures yeah. on our Facebook page. We'd love to see them. So have a great week, everybody. We'll see you here next Thursday, 6 p.m., as we do each and every week.